standard use is, would the ordinary intelligent person accept the definition? Motion. And you will get these from time to time. 
You can have a definition motion. You can have a definition motion. Right? Uh, let's see. The novel Bridge Over the Dvina is one of the great books of all time. You have a category, great books of all time, and the argument is that Bridge Over the Dvina meets this category and meets this definition. <laughs> you can have fact debates about conditions of the past. About conditions of the past. The Egyptian pyramids were constructed with the assistance of extraterrestrials. Right? Something about the past. You can have a fact debate about the present. About the present. For example, free trade does more harm than good. Free trade does more harm than good. You can have a fact debate about the future. Yes, we can debate about future facts. Right? One of my uh, favorite ones is humanity will fail to reach the 22nd century. Humanity will fail to reach the 22nd century. In other words, we'll destroy ourselves during this century. Okay? Now, you know, a lot of times, let's take the motion, this house believes that free trade harms the developing world. Okay? Free trade harms the developing world. Well, you are discussing policy in some way. Right? If it's bad, if free trade is bad, then we probably shouldn't have it. Right? And so, but you're not formally proposing that we eliminate free trade. You're just talking about what the facts of the matter are. Now, when you're presenting a fact case, these are the kinds of things you should consider having in the first speech. You should define the words at stake. You should define the words. Might I just say that Slovenian debaters tend to be a little weak in defining the words. You just assume that the words is words and that's the way it is. I don't know if it's a language thing or whatever. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to define words. The world school's rules say you shouldn't be afraid to use a dictionary definition of a word. This does not mean that you need to define every word, like the, right? But terms that might be of dispute, right? For example, you might want to define what you mean by free trade, right? What do you mean by free trade? I mean, you can think of it in different sorts of ways. Um, one thing is that in a lot of these terms that you encounter in debate, that you know, two words, if you define them separately, free means, you know, having no barriers or no costs. Trade means exchange, right? So if you define these words separately, you might get a much broader or different idea than if you put them together as what is known in interpretation of words as a term of art, a term of art, okay? Um, and if you put the term of art free trade together, you will notice that free trade is a policy that countries have in their commercial transactions with each other that these transactions should be, you know, should be free of all kinds of tariffs or quotas or uh, extra charges. For example, uh, in Korea, it's extremely expensive to buy a Volkswagen because they put a tariff on it, an extra charge for any imported car. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think they put charges on Volkswagen? They have their own cars. Yeah, they have their own cars. They want you to buy Hyundais and Daewoo's. That's what they want you to buy. They want to subsidize their, their home industry. Okay? So you need to define the terms that you think are going to be slippery. And frankly, as a judge, if there's a term like free trade that you should have defined, and then 
the debate becomes confused. Oh, but does that include safety regulations or not? And what, what does it actually include? I'll tend to blame the proposition team. They should have defined it. The debate got messed up because they didn't define this term. Now, the EU is very tricky. The things that they don't want to compete with their products, they don't use tariffs or quotas. What they do is say, oh, we don't think that's safe, so you can't import it. Okay? Now, the EU has a, a thing about agricultural products, right? Because the EU subsidizes farmers hugely. Because farmers are an important political force, uh, and they want to keep them in business. Well, fine. So the America and Argentina and Brazil have all these really cheap agricultural products. So instead of saying, no, we can't import those, or there's a 20% extra charge on all these products, the EU says, oh, they are dangerous. Why American meat is not raised in the same standard as ours. That American grain has genetic varieties that have been manipulated that we don't accept. Okay? And so this is how they came up. This is an example of how, I mean, if you're debating about free trade, this could be a very important issue. Countries could use these safety regulations to stop to, to, to stop the free trade. So it's important to know what it's all about. Definitions. Second thing you should do in the first speech is to present a standard for proof. A standard for proof. How do we know when something has been proven as a fact? And here are a few options for doing that. Preponderance of evidence. Preponderance of evidence. Well, there's more evidence to indicate that free trade hurts developing countries than that it helps them. Does anybody want to define preponderance for us? With the majority of evidence. Preponderance is another word for majority. And I will be giving you new English language words, because I think if you're debating in English, the more words you have, and the more impressive you can sound, the better off you'll be. Plus, you can go home to your school, you know, English class and start flashing around some nice words and your teacher will love you. So preponderance of evidence. Consensus of experts. Consensus of experts. Now consensus is sort of a word about, you know, kind of like preponderance. Most experts say, that. You know, we have experts that say that it's bad. You have one that who say it's good. All right, we win. The other standard is a legal standard beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That's where you would be pretty certain that something is true. You would be fairly certain that something is true. If I have Tim on trial, for the theft of Mihai's wallet, you know, I'll never be absolutely sure. I can't go back in time and watch the incident as how it happened. I don't have absolute proof, right? So we can never absolutely prove that anything is true. But we do have conclusions that we can make beyond a reasonable doubt about something. Um, you could also construct your own standard for this, right? What would the reasonable person conclude? What would the reasonable person conclude? Would a reasonable person look at this evidence and decide that yes, the proposition team has proven this fact, and then that would be cool. So first thing is define, second thing is present a standard for proof. And you want to do this. You want to give the judge a guideline for how to make the decision. Otherwise, who knows what kind of crazy decision they're going to make. In fact, even if you do present a standard, who knows what kind of crazy decision they're going to make. But you need to give them as much help as possible. 
Third and finally, you want to make strong factual points that support the conclusion. You want to make strong factual points that support the conclusion. And when I say factual points, I mean not just arguments, right? Not just arguments, but arguments that attempt to prove a fact. Now, if we're trying to show that free trade hurts developing nations, can somebody give me an example of a factual argument that would attempt to establish that free trade hurts them? Um, okay, make the argument. That's a that's a subject, by the way. What, what's the argument? Usually there's a value term and then an object. 
usually there's a value term and then an object. Now these values are often very abstract. Let's take some value terms. Beauty, Love. freedom, truth, yep. fairness, justice, sexiness, Democracy, right? They tend to be very value terms. They tend to be very abstract, right? Who knows what beauty is? Beauty is different in different contexts. I like going to Jamaica because in Jamaica, fat people are beautiful. Yeah, really beautiful. You know why that's true? First, it means you have enough money to feed yourself, so that makes you beautiful. And second, it means you're not HIV positive, right? So because then you tend to lose weight and get really skinny. So it's, so it's nice. And you know, women in Jamaica, if you have a fat butt, that's a good thing. Now in Europe, you need to be a American. So values are different in different places. They're abstract. The thing about values is, that, you know, the importance of a value is often found in its application. The importance of a value is found in its application. And let's just take a simple value like freedom. Freedom good. Okay? We want unlimited freedom. All right. Now, is it good if I have the freedom to decide where to live? Okay. Is it good if I have the freedom to decide whether to hit you in the head with a hammer? No. 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 Okay. So freedom doesn't just mean doing whatever you want. Right? It's found in, in its application. The freedom to do bad things is probably bad. And the freedom to do good things that don't hurt anybody is probably good. So through the process of value argumentation, you have to always think, how will this be used? Right? How will this be used? Let's talk about, you know, uh, no, I don't want to talk about that. That's my license. Values also occur in hierarchies, right? Some values are more important than others. Right? Like you have the value of freedom, doing what, what you want to do. It may be limited, but it's there. Okay? Now let's take another value term truth. Okay? Which one do you think is more important to you? Truth or freedom? Freedom. Okay? Are you more willing to compromise the truth? then you are to compromise freedom? Yeah. All right, that would be a sign of that. Tell me instances of where you're willing to compromise the truth. Lie. Well, obviously when you lie, you are compromising the truth. So what I'm asking you is, when is it okay to lie? When it's the right situation. When it's a white lie. Okay, this is like, this is meaningless, right? White lie means good lie, okay. What is a good lie? Give me an example of a white lie. Well, when you see someone who is not pretty, for example, and, or who has bought new clothes, who has bought new clothes. How do you like my new outfit? And then you say, well, it's all right. It suits you, although she is really... Well, she? I was thinking more of you. Oh, you look great. Um, I, you know, personally, I have a very strong commitment to the value of truth. So in this situation, I said, wow, that's some outfit. <laughs> right? I wouldn't say it looks good because it doesn't look good. Or, wow, what a unique outfit. Wow, that's really interestingly different. <laughs> You know why people lie? Because they're not creative. They're not creative. They don't have to lie. You can say something that they'll be pleased to hear. Right? 
Oh, it looks good on that outfit. Looks really good on a fat person like you. <laughs> no, I guess you wouldn't say that. Okay. So you know there are hierarchies. Some some values are more important than other. Tell me a value term that you think is not kind of low in the hierarchy, not very important. Justice. Justice. Okay, I'll remember that when I judge you. <laughs> I think that could be fairly important. Uh, beauty is one that I think is fairly low. Pretty easy to manipulate. I can live without it. Uh, it's very beautiful here in this, well, not in this room, too many rodents. But I mean, the view outside, it's very nice. It's kind of beautiful. But, you know, I can get by without it. I'm not sure I could get by without justice. Right, if every time I came to eat that, you know, woman who supervises the food thing would say, you know, you get to the back of the line. People with beards eat last. <laughs> All right, that would bother me. Right? You get what everyone else doesn't want. Okay, so, I mean, some values are higher than others, and that's important because values can be mutually eroding. Eroding. E-R-O-D-I-N-G. Eroding means it's worn down or washed away. Right? Like when this farm, when the farmer has a field and there's too much rain and all the soil on the top runs away, the rain washes away, this is called soil erosion. So values can be mutually eroded. When some values go up, others go down. And when you're going to engage in value argumentation, this is a good thing to know. Oh, they're promoting this value? Hmm. I wonder which values go down when you do that. Okay, so I'm going to give you some values, and you tell me what might be mutually eroded, which, which goes down when that goes up. Privacy. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Privacy. Privacy and security. Right? Why does why is private? Why, okay. Spell out your reason why when privacy goes up, security goes down. I would use that as an example. Can you make a more abstract argument? Um, well, it, it, every time you're targeting individuals, if you're trying to find an individual which you think is a terrorist or might harm your personal rights, you need to have more information. The only way you can do that is by having a large amount of individuals whose privacy you invade by gaining their personal information. All right, so we need to invade people's privacy in order to identify dangerous people. Is that what you're saying? I'm not buying that. But that's why we have debate. You need to understand that. That's why we have debate. Uh, how about this? Right to know. Privacy erodes with right to know. Right. Do you have a right to know about the conduct of your leaders? Yeah. yeah. Do you have the right to know? But the more we give, the more Yansha's personal life is considered private then the less we know about it, right? So the privacy would trade off with right to know. Okay. We talked about democracy. How about meritocracy? Oh, let's take Singapore, for example. It considers itself as a meritocracy. A, merit a meritocracy is a society where if you perform, you get rewarded. Doesn't matter who your family is, it doesn't matter your race, and that's good in Singapore because they have many different racial and ethnic groups. It's how well you do on the test, right? How well you perform in school, right? And then you get money, you get promotion, you get advantage, you get benefit, you get status, okay? What does that trade, can you think of a value that meritocracy trades off with? Equality. Equality. 
Exactly. Right? Some people are, you know, if they have this merit, then they get all kinds of benefits and advantages that other people don't. So you need to be aware that there is, you know, the, these mutually eroding values. Here are different types of value motions that you might look at. Okay? And I'm going to give you a little formula, and then we'll insert a topic as an example. In terms of x, y is better or worse than z? In terms of x, y is better or worse than z? Let me give you an example. In terms of literature, Shakespeare is better than Dickens. In terms of literature, Shakespeare is better than Dickens. Okay? That would be an example. Better literature. Here's another type of value topic. Something is always right or wrong. Something is always right or wrong. The death penalty as punishment is always wrong always unfair, or always unjust, or always cruel, or, or just wrong, okay? So you take every example of the death penalty would be wrong. How would you oppose such a motion? Well, killing someone is wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, don't kill them. Uh, maybe kill the uh, mass murderer. Yes, you would find an example that disproves this. How do you have to prove, how many examples do you have to show of where the death penalty is justified to disprove the statement, all use of the death penalty is bad? One. One. Okay? So you would pick, you know, mass murderers of children, right? Or, uh, you know, perpetrators of genocide, right? You would pick just one. Right? Now, if it said, if, 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 you, if you had a motion that said, uh, war criminals should be given the death penalty. Right? The death penalty is justified for those who commit crimes against humanity. Okay? How would you oppose that? Well, not as defined in international law, but killing one person is never a crime against humanity. Well, killing them does face any specific limitations. Okay, that there would be no tangible advantage. But, okay, why wouldn't you say all use of the death penalty is wrong in opposing that? See what I mean? All use of the death penalty is wrong. It's wrong for murderers, it's wrong for rapists, it's wrong for those who torture, and it's wrong for those who are war criminals. Okay, so you notice in, in one instance of this value topic, the opposition only had to prove that one example. And then in another use of this value topic, they would say have, no, all use of the death penalty is wrong. Now, the thing about this is that policies uh, that governments adopt are often based on values, right? They're often based on values. So one of the things you can talk about in exploring any value topic is that you can say, well, if we endorse this value, what kind of policies would that lead to, and would that be bad, okay? What kind of policies would that lead to, and would they be bad? So this is called a policy objection to a value case, right? Now, let's think about meritocracy. Let's say the motion is uh, meritocracy is the best way to organize a society, okay? All right, so we're gonna have policies about that. 
Can you think of bad policies that might come from a endorsement of meritocracy? <coughs> Yeah, disadvantage of the disabled, very good, dummy. And I'm sitting here, you and I are, are having a mental telepathy experience because that's exactly what I was thinking of, right? There's less merit, especially the mentally handicapped, right? They're not going to score very high on the test. They're not going to do very well in the meritocracy. And so they're going to always be at the bottom of society. And so what value is infringed for them? value that erodes with meritocracy, which is equality. equality. Right, exactly. So in order to understand how these values work, you have to think about how they're applied to real situations, what other values they might trade off with, and what policies they may lead to. Let's talk about how to put together a value case. Let's talk about how to put together a value case. Because when we were talking in my group about creating a case for this, you know, should not eat meat, right? A couple of people were talking about framing it as a value case, not as a policy case, right? So how would you do that? First thing you have to do is you have to define the value term. This is incredibly important. If you don't define the value term carefully and correctly, you are in big trouble. Because as we know, these value terms tend to be abstract, they're fairly slippery, they're hard to define, and you might actually have to engage in some serious explanation and argumentation. Is there a simple one sentence definition of justice? No. Probably not, right? Are there more than one definition of justice? Yeah. Yes. Okay? Like there's the, you know, Rawlsian, or John Rawls, his approach to justice, right? The justice is where the least advantaged do not lose privilege. Okay? So there's different, so you really have to make sure that you define this. It's incredibly important. You need to think ahead about how this value interacts with other values. In designing your case, you need to think about how it interacts with other values. I think one approach is to values is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is based on what we need is people, and it's kind of a pyramid. Is anybody familiar with this? Yeah. Yes. Okay, never mind. Okay, some needs are more important than others. Right, first, you have to live. Right, you have a right to life, you have to be alive. Before you can be free, before you can be beautiful, and before you can be equal, you have to be alive. Right, and then there are other needs that go up, and the more um, abstract, values tend to be at the top, whereas physical needs, safety and security needs, social needs, and then what's called self-actualization needs, right? Now, does that mean that the ones at the bottom are always more important than the ones at the top? No. Do you think anyone has ever sacrificed their safety for beauty. Yeah. 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 What about all those people who puncture themselves and body modifications and it's pretty funky. Has anyone ever decided to give their life for their friends? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So that just because the pyramid sort of has certain things at the bottom doesn't mean that people don't have choice about what to do with that. Look, I put them to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I have. I have put them to sleep. Wow. I'm powerful, I'll tell you. Who knows what I'm doing to you? 
If I put the road was this way, my lecture is so good it puts the road was this way. Okay? Then you have to have strong reasons why the value is successfully applied to the object of the motion. Right? You have a value term, you have the object of the motion. Death penalty, that's the object. Is wrong, that's the value. You have to have strong arguments to apply to the object of the motion. And that's generally what you're supposed to do. Now, some motions ask us to compare values. Right? Freedom of the press is more important than right to privacy. Freedom of the press is more important than right to privacy. Can you think of some examples that might illustrate? Tabloids. What? Tabloids. Tabloids, yeah. Paparazzi, right? I really want to get a picture of Angela Merkel's butt. And so I'm going to. Your right to know about what Angela Merkel's butt looks like is more important than her right to have a private butt. Right? And so quite often, you have these kinds of things where two values will be concerned. Okay? Then you have to prove that one value is more important than another. How might you prove that one value is more important than another? Well, by accuracy. By what? Don't say I don't know when you're answering my question. If you don't know, then you should But I'd love to hear your answer. Go. No. No. Sorry. With examples. With examples. Very good. Okay. What kind of examples? To show um, um, that one value is more important than the other. Okay. That one value is more important than the other. It's higher in the hierarchy, right? Okay. That's good. Good, good, good. Other ways? And what kind of objective criterion would that be? I, I believe that's what I'm looking for. Okay. So objective criteria. Uh, well, why do we say today we'd like to look at what what benefits of the specific group and what right. the values? Absolutely. What are the benefits? What are the applications of these values? Okay? If we take this value as important and start to do things that support this value, will those things be good things? Now, if the right, and, and, and if, you know, privacy is more important than, uh, if freedom of the press is more important than right to privacy, then why can't uh, they put cameras in the boys' locker room, in the showers, and then sell it on the internet? I'm not sure who would buy it, but I was going to say girls, but I didn't want to. We fringe on our sisters all the time, so, you know. Right, so you have to think about, if you take this freedom of the press, right, and say it always trumps the right to privacy, you can think of examples of where you implemented that doctrine that would be bad. And that can help you make arguments. Uh, remember, some rights are limited. Some rights are limited. Uh, what are some general ways in which our rights are limited? As long as they do not infringe the rights of others. Yeah, if you don't infringe on the rights of others. Right? Generally, you have rights as long as they don't infringe on others. If I, you know, I have the right to make money, but then if I use my money to try to oppress others, that would be bad. Right? I have the right to free speech. Does that mean that I could always use free speech? No. No. What are some examples of where I couldn't use free speech? Hate speech. Hate speech. Screaming fire in a theater. Screaming fire in a theater. You were there for my example the other day. Right? You stand up in the middle of a movie and you scream, fire, fire. <laughs> and what does everybody do? Run. They run. And they trample people. And it's while, meanwhile, you're laughing. <laughs> right? That's a 
the bad news for free speech. Okay? Um, the United States Supreme Court has developed a number of tests. One of them is fighting words. Right? You shouldn't all you shouldn't be allowed to say things that would incite violence. Right? And that has been used in the EU to include hate speech. Right? Because hate speech might, you know, incite violence. You don't want that. You know, you wouldn't, you know, uh, in, in the UK, for example, you can't stand up and, uh, and give a speech saying, kill the Jews. Let's round up all the Jews. Let's kill the Jews. Or the Muslims, or the Druids, or whoever. <laughs> right? Because you're encouraging violence. So to the extent that the use of a right harms or damages other people, physically, mentally, whatever. And to the extent that your exercise of your rights infringes on other people's rights, okay? These are all values. Value debate starts at an abstraction, and you win the debate when you make your arguments more concrete, right? More real about how the application of these values will have real results. Next kind of topic, a topic of policy. Something should be done. Something should be done. A policy topic calls for action. The critical word that you will often see in a policy motion is the word should. Somebody or something should do something. This house believes that Holocaust denial should be a crime. This house believes that the United States should withdraw from its military bases in Asia. Now, it doesn't have to have the word should in it. Try this one. This house would make the development of clean industry a condition for receiving development assistance. This house would make the development of clean industry a condition for receiving development assistance. I mean, the word should's not there, but it's calling for some kind of action. Usually, other topics, the value topic, topics tends to transcend time, right? Because freedom is important. 100 years ago, today, 100 years from now. The fact topic can be located in the past, present, or the future. The policy topic is almost always located right now, in the present. But it's looking towards the future. All policy motions are kind of like science fiction stories. If this happens, then we'll get this kind of world. And the proposition team says, we'll get a better world. And the opposition team says, we'll get a worse world. The action can take place at a bunch of different levels. International, national, regional, local, organizational. You could talk just about a business or a group or, you know, Zip should give Boyana a raise in pay or something like that. Um, or you can talk about individual. I waited until, I waited until she left the room. Uh, or you can talk about individual. Right? Voters should elect Yansha next time. Right? And so all of these things can be actors in this situation. Okay. We're about halfway through, and before I talk about what happens in a policy controversy and how to make a policy case, let's take five.